Fruition of Karma Levels of Fruition The most frequently debated subject in regard to karma pertains to the fruits of karma. In particular, many people doubt the validity of the principle stating do good, reap good, do evil, reap evil. They gather evidence demonstrating how in real life many people who perform bad actions acquire good things and maybe many people who perform good actions receive bad things. These doubts arise due to a confusion between the law of karma, karma niyama, and conventional laws, samati niyama, whereby these two laws become mixed up. People often fail to distinguish between the boundaries or various stages of these two laws. Even the terms contained in this aforementioned principle are not clearly understood. Instead of understanding the phrase do good, reap good, as equivalent to practicing goodness, one obtains goodness, practicing goodness, one is endowed with goodness. Practicing goodness gives rise to goodness, or practicing goodness leads to wholesome fruits. According to the law of karma, people interpret it as by practicing goodness one acquires favorable objects, personal advantages, or gratifying material things. To help clarify this matter, Consider the following four levels at which karma bears fruit. 1. The level of the mind. Here one considers how actions affect the mind by the accumulation of wholesome and unwholesome attributes, the accumulation of strengths and capabilities. One considers how actions shape a person's thoughts and feelings, tendencies, preferences, joys and sorrows, etc. To the level of personality, here one considers how actions establish a person's habitual disposition and how they determine behaviour, attitudes, ability to adapt to various circumstances, reactions and general interactions with other people and the surrounding environment. This level is connected to the level of mind, but is distinguished in to highlight specific aspects of fruition. 3. The level of a person's general state of life. Here one considers how actions influence a person's life, i.e. how they lead to satisfy how they lead to satisfactory and unsatisfactory experiences, to various rewards and compensations from outside, to progress and decline, to success and failure, to various forms of gain like material possessions, prestige, praise and pleasure, and to corresponding forms of loss. These results can be subdivided into two kinds. Results from non-human factors in one's environment, results stemming from other people and society. For the level of society, here one considers how people's actions affect society, for example, how they lead to social progress or decline, and to collective well-being or distress. Moreover, one considers the effects people's actions have on the natural environment. The first two levels pertain primarily to the law of karma, karma ni yama. Level 3 involves a relationship between the law of karma and conventional laws, samati ni yama, which often causes confusion for people. The fourth level, the fourth level despite being important, lies outside the domain of the present subject matter at hand. Generally speaking, when people look at the fruits of their own actions, or when they examine the validity of whether other people truly do good and receive good, do bad and receive bad, they limit their inspection to the third level, that is, 
they focus on external rewards. By doing this, they overlook the results connected to the first and second levels, although these are of vital importance. <coughs> they are important in and of themselves, example the factors of happiness and unhappiness, mental strengths and weaknesses, mental capabilities and the proficiency or deficiency of spiritual faculties, and they are also important as a key source for the results pertaining to the third level, influencing one's general state of life. Results at levels 1 and 2, the mind and the personality, mutually reinforce one another, and they go on to influence how one lives one's life, level 3. Aspects of the third level belonging to the sphere of the law of Kama, Kama Ni Yama, and include, are linked to the results of the first and second levels to one's overall state of mind, including one's interests, preferences, and proclivities. The way one pursues happiness or vents frustration, for instance, which is connected to the level of the mind, influences how one perceives and responds to things, how one experiences things and how one acts and lives one's life. In this context, one should examine in what manner people perform particular deeds. Do they follow through with and complete their action? How many obstructions are they willing to face? Are they meticulous or careless, disciplined or slack? Furthermore, how do their actions affect other people's thoughts and feelings, which may <coughs> rebound and affect them in turn, say by receiving cooperation or by facing opposition. One's personality influences how other people play a part in one's obtaining either satisfactory or unsatisfactory results. This is not to deny other factors in the process, in particular those conditions in one's social environment that are linked to the law of karma and determine one's state of well-being. Here in this chapter, however, the focus is on karma <coughs> as it pertains to a person's inner life. Wider perspective is outlined in the following chapters on external influences and virtuous friendship. The preceding teachings on the law of karma aim to help people improve themselves within the domain of personal actions. Moreover, besides improving oneself, one can guide other people to aspire towards goodness by providing a wholesome environment according to the principles of a favourable environment. Patiru pa de sawa sa Virtuous friendship Kalyana Mita Ta and association with good people Saparisa Pasaya. For the most part, the fruits of karma manifesting on the third level, one's way of life, are connected to the mind and personality. Those people who love their work are honest and diligent and manage their work well will generally generally receive positive results from of their labour, at least more than those who are lazy or dishonest. Honest and virtuous civil servants who are capable and eager to fulfil the terms of their office will generally advance in their profession better than those who are incapable or half-hearted. Yet, sometimes this is not the case, because results at this l third level are not exclusively generated by the law of karma. Factors from other laws and standards, in particular conventional laws, are involved. <coughs> An inability to recognise the involvement by these other factors and to distinguish between the relative boundaries of these various laws led, leads to confusion. 
Related to this discussion is the phrase, do good, receive bad, do bad, receive good. If the law of karma operates solely on its own, there is no problem. The results accord directly with the actions. If one earnestly reads a book, one will receive knowledge. But sometimes the body may be fatigued, one has a headache. Or the temperature is too hot and one cannot finish the reading assignment or one does not assimilate what one reads. Or perhaps there may arise some kind of mishap and one is interrupted. In any case, one should remember that for human beings the law of karma is the essential guiding factor in determining positive and negative results in their lives. Even before clearly examining the various related causes and conditions, someone who is disappointed may reflect that had one not done these good deeds, things may have turned out much worse. Similarly, if others do good yet do not immediately receive positive results, one can reflect that had they not acted well, they may have fallen into hard times. By reflecting in this way, one gains an understanding that no volitional actions are fruitless, and many of them produce profound effects on one's state of mind and personality. The common expression, do good receive good, do bad receive bad, is derived from the following Buddhist proverb. Whatever sort of seed is sown, that is the sort of fruit one reaps. The doer of good reaps good, the doer of, the doer of evil reaps evil. Here the Buddha quotes verses by previous rishis and bodhisattvas and assimilates them t- into the Tipitaka. These verses may be considered a clear and concise description of the Buddhist principle of karma. Note how the first pair of verses applies biological laws, bija niyama, for comparison. This observation helps one to distinguish between the law of karma and conventional laws. According to the laws of botany, the fruit is directly related to the seed. If one plants tamarind, one gets tamarind. If one plants grapes, one gets grapes. If one plants cabbage, one gets cabbage. There is no reference here to conventional laws. There is no mentioning of planting tamarinds and getting money, or planting cabbages and making a healthy profit. These conditions apply to another stage of the process. There is a relationship between biological laws and conventional laws. If one has planted grapes and it happens that the market that year demands grapes, one can sell them at a good price and get rich. On another occasion, however, one may grow watermelons, but many people, many other people do so as well. And so the fruit floods the market and the price drops. In that year, one loses money. Apart from ordinary market forces, there may be other factors involved, like middlemen who force the price down. The important issue here, however, is to recognize the stability and certainty of biological laws, and to discern both the distinction and relationship between biological laws and conventional laws. This comparison applies also to the law of karma which people often confuse with conventional laws by saying do good, receive good, in the sense that by doing good one will become rich or get a promotion, although these results are likely. 
They do not always occur. It is like saying, planting mangoes is profitable, planting coconuts makes you rich, or planting custard apples makes you poor, which may not, which may or may not be true, but this sort of statement skips some stages in the process. It is not a thorough description of the truth. It may be acceptable for colloquial speech, but if one wishes to accurately portray the truth, one needs to distinguish the various causes and conditions in an ordered sequence.